Assalamu alaikum, welcome to Game Changer, I am Mariam Zia. Tonight we will delve into general elections 2024 that are slated for February 8th. Uh, of course, as uh, the political landscape intensifies, all the political parties, major political parties are gearing up uh, their campaigns for these elections. In today's program, we will be, of course, uh, talking about all the manifestos of different uh, political parties. Uh, when we talk about these manifestos, uh, Jamaat Islami and PPP have already announced uh, their manifestos, while uh, PMLN and PTI are still working and they are announced uh, to uh, they will be announced soon uh, we'll be talking about uh, the key points uh, that these manifestos are addressing and of course the key challenges that are being faced by the country because there is a recent report by pide uh, that tells us uh, that pmln pti and ppp have scored less than 20 percent on critical national issues in their past manifestos and their political discourse. Uh, so today we will be talking about these manifestos and what are the global best practices uh, when we talk about policy making? Uh, what are key challenges uh, when we talk about the country and the common man are facing and how uh, these parties, political parties are addressing or are going to be addressing uh, these challenges? Are the manifestos addressing uh, those key challenges or uh, they are going to be manifested in the form of unfulfilled promises or they are going to be presenting uh, some pragmatic solutions to the challenges, especially the economic instability that the country is facing. We will be talking about all these points in today's program, but uh, we will be watching a report first that our team has prepared about these manifestos and the alliances that these political parties are uh, of, uh, are of course going to be making. Let's watch this report. Millions of Pakistanis gear up to turn to the ballot box next month to elect their representatives. The country faces a complex symphony of challenges, a struggling economy, wobbly politics and ongoing security concerns. For economic revival of Pakistan, Pakistan's People's Party has given a 10-point manifesto. The manifesto's central commitments include doubling the salaries for the salaried class, which is heavily taxed, and revising the tax slabs in accordance with the International Monetary Fund and World Bank recommendations. The manifesto also promises to abolish 17 ministries deemed redundant, a move aimed at streamlining government operations and improving efficiency. PMLN is planning to announce their manifesto in the coming week, while Jamaat Islami has also announced their manifesto. JI's manifesto promises free electricity, parliamentary debate on defence spending and revisiting contracts with IPPs. We watched this report on, uh, of course, uh, the political manifestos and uh, the alliances that these parties are going to be making. Uh, now to talk more about all these issues, uh, we are uh, joined in the studios by Mr. Uh, Javed Khan Jadun, who is political analyst. Welcome to the program. Mm -hmm. We are also joined by Mr. Shehjar Khan, who is political and international mm -hmm. affairs uh, commentator. Welcome to the program. Uh, so Mr. Javed Jadun, uh, let me start with you. Of course, um, now uh, all the nation is hoping for elections to be held on February 8th. Uh, when we talk about these manifestos, uh, some parties have announced their manifestos, some are still working on these and we are expecting they will be announced in two to three days. Uh, what is your take uh, on the manifestos that have been uh, you know, announced so far, Speci especially let's start from PPP's 10-point agenda that has been uh, presented so far? Uh, thank you, Mariam. I think it is extremely important in any democracy, whether parliamentary or presidential, that uh, political parties present their manifestos uh, when they go to the elections. Uh, because the people of, people of any given society or country, uh, be that Pakistan, uh, we are talking about general elections in Pakistan on February the 8th. I think people are anxiously waiting for the manifestos to come out uh, as far as the three major political parties are concerned. You talked about uh, Pakistan People's Party's 10-point agenda, not the manifesto, because manifesto is entirely something else. Uh, Pakistan Muslim League N hasn't uh, presented its manifesto to the people. Mm -hmm. Same is the case with Pakistan Tariq Insaf and many other regional parties. Right, but they have uh, in-house uh, formed committees that are working on these okay. manifestos. Okay. 
Okay. And they are expected to be announced in the coming week. When, when we talk about manifestos, mm. we need to talk about the challenges Pakistan is going to mm. face in 2024, most importantly, the economic challenge. True. Let us mention a very recent report of the UN's World Economic Situation and Prospects Report for 2024 and look at the challenges which they have listed for Pakistan. Uh, I think they are very serious and very grave challenges Pakistan's economy faces. One is uh, the uh, dismal uh, growth rate. Of course, the growth rate uh, forecast for the mm. global uh, mm. economy is also not really good, about 3%. But as far as Pakistan is concerned, it is going to be about 2% in 2024 and 2.4 uh, uh, or 5% in 2025. This is uh, one of the biggest challenge for any political government or a coalition government which is going to come into power yeah. as a result of uh, uh, February the mm. 8th of uh, general elections. And the second uh, the challenge which is uh, definitely staring all the political parties who are aspiring to, uh, to get into power in Pakistan or even is sitting the at the <coughs> you know, opposition benches, it is important to keep a check on the treasury benches, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Inflation. Because it is biting you, me, and every person in Pakistan. Uh, the, the report has listed uh, the, uh, the, the inflation as at 39.18% mm -hmm. in the outgoing year 2023. Uh, apparently, we haven't seen the kind of uh, pessimism on part of the economic managers because if you look at the, uh, the inflation rates in November, uh, monthly rates I'm talking about, this is the annual, uh, right. uh, th these are the annual rates. In November, the inflation was 29.2%. In December, it rose to 29.7%. Mm. So once again, we see a kind of a spike in inflation. Uh, the common man, for, for, uh, for, for the people of Pakistan, the common yardstick is uh, their buying power. If of it course. diminishes, of course, they would be uh, looking towards the political parties, what kind of uh, manifestos they are going to present and uh, the resolutions they have as far as the economic challenges are concerned. Because you, me, the middle class and lo the lower middle class and even the people who are uh, around, hovering around the poverty uh, line and below the poverty line as well. It's very unfortunate that political parties, they talk about democracy, they talk about uh, resolving the myriads of problems of the people of Pakistan. But less than a month remaining, uh, I'm talking about the two main political parties, PMLN right. and PTI. They are still to have... They are still working. You said they're working. Yes. But manifestos are not worked out at the 11th hour. If you have uh, political solutions, economic solutions, solutions to the country's national security, mm -hmm. rising terrorism, and the foreign policy paradigms as well, they are the continuing process. You of don't course. go in on, on the drawing board uh, on the land power, and yes. then you say that, well, we are working on it. Why, are they, why there's not an evolving process of preparing manifestos? If you have solutions, then you must have a think tank within the political parties. Mm. We don't see that kind of a think right. tank of course, in very any important main point political party. We will be talking about that uh, as well. Uh, but you are uh, very rightly mentioned by uh, Jadun Saab that these are the areas that should be, um, of course, addressed in the political parties' manifestos. And as some of the major parties are still working on their manifestos, uh, what do you think, what policy measures uh, should be taken in their manifestos to kind of uh, give, give priority uh, to the issues of economic stability uh, or uh, to the issues of common man uh, that, of course, the buying power is an issue, inflation is a major issue. What kind of measures should be taken, so, Mariam, specifically manifestos? Okay. Mariam, uh, that's a very interesting question. Your question can be looked at the backdrop of how political parties in Pakistan are treating manifestos. So a manifesto generally is a public de declaration of the policies, the promises, or the way forward that a political party has when it come, would eventually come mm. into power and what would they be delivering on or what are the key points. Mm. Now, historically, these manifestos are not used as a document that could hold a political party to account yes. or the promises that the political party made were those promises fulfilled when the party came into power. Mm. So first of all, we have to like see whether a manifesto is a policy document or is it a po document that like makes tall promises and gives these like dreams to the people and whether those dreams or those policies are practically realizable, that's a different story mm. altogether. So this is like a change in culture that is like required in terms of the poly crisis that Pakistan is going through. I would be interested in, 
interested in knowing that all the mainstream political parties, what structural reforms, long-term agenda that they have when it comes to increasing Pakistan's income, mm. when it in, uh, comes to increasing the taxation, when it comes to bringing investment into Pakistan, when it comes to economic reforms, <coughs> what are these parties bringing to the table? Unfortunately, I agree with Jadoon Saab uh, uh, very clearly that a clear direction is missing from all political parties. Uh, again, we're like almost a month uh, away from the elections. I don't see a clear guideline or clear policy document coming from any of the mainstream political parties when it comes to handling these uh, very grave crises that Pakistan is going through. Right. Le let's. Uh, we are also joined online by Mr. Humayu Khan, who is, of course, political analyst. Uh, welcome to the program, uh, uh, Mr. Humayu. Uh, so, of course, uh, when we talk about uh, these manifestos, can we expect that the upcoming uh, manifestos that are yet to be announced uh, by uh, some major political parties like PMLN and PTI are going to be addressing the debt challenges or the economic instability that the country uh, is facing? Of course, uh, uh, the talks uh, with IMF are going to be or are expected to be maturing in February as well. Do you think these issues will be included in the upcoming manifestos and what's your take on PIDE report as well uh, regarding th these three major political parties? Uh, thank you, Mariam. I guess uh, I will continue where uh, Jazun Saab and Sharyar were mentioning. I think a country like Pakistan, and particularly when we're talking about a South Asian country where the literacy level is not too much, uh, these manifestos, which are promises, declaration of their policies or a future direction, uh, in, in a way have not been up to the mark up till now. Although now we are entering into a new age, which is social media and information technology, uh, these things do matter in a way that people can hold these political parties accountable for the promises that they made before elections. Uh, not necessarily in a way because, as Shahyar was also mentioning, Pakistan is considering uh, a country which is now in a huge, uh, a grave crisis. The Shahyar mentioned the word polycrisis, which is a combination of multiple crises. We are facing climate change. We are facing economic challenges. Uh, we are facing structural reforms. We are facing uh, police reforms. We are facing bureaucracy reforms. We are facing state enterprises, which have become like white elephants. We are facing tax-related issues. Our revenue collection has not been up to the mark so far. So in that sense, I guess the manifesto when they these political party announced it, it's basically a, just a direction that you know we will try to fix and we'll try to do certain things it's not like a complete plan that how they're going to do and why they cannot do that it all depends on the election what will be the outcome of the election what are the going to be uh, the coalition governments, what are going to be the numbers which each political party gain, what are going to be the provincial uh, setup, because after 18th Amendment now we have provincial governments which are relatively more powerful than they used to be. So in that sense, <clears throat> I guess these uh, manifesto, they do have a huge uh, or a, a very important uh, role to play in the political sense. But in another way, considering Pakistan, I guess this they just give a future direction how this political party goes and the voters can hold their uh, political parties accountable on these promises if they don't deliver on them in future. Right, right. So, Jadun Saab, when we talk about these manifestos, uh, in your opinion, what role does the upcoming talks with IMF uh, plays or should be playing in shaping these manifestos? Because that is a huge challenge uh, 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 that uh, the upcoming government has to take on. And uh, is the, are the political parties or the uh, forthcoming um, uh, or the upcoming government is able uh, to ma make polit uh, politically difficult decisions to, of course, negotiate with IMF and what kind of negotiations to, should be held if the economic uh, instability is not even an issue in these manifestos. What do you I think of it? Uh, as far as the IMF uh, program is concerned, the $3 billion stand by a program which is going to expire, uh, of course, this year. And uh, the new government, which our uh, political party comes into power, will have to renegotiate with the IMF in somewhere in March, I think. Mm. And not uh, doing that is not an option for Pakistan of because course. Pakistan is still not out of the woods. If you look at uh, the debt to GDP ratio, even mentioned in the UN report as well, it was 
about 89% in, uh, in 2022, which is very serious. I think it was one of the highest in, in, in the world, and at least in, uh, in, in our own region. Our currency lost its value by 20% in 2023, though we now see a kind of a stabilization after the intervention of uh, army, uh, while having a crackdown against the smuggling and hoarding of uh, dollar and dollarization of Pakistan's economy was discouraged. And secondly, uh, I, as, as far as IMF is concerned, I don't see any particular role, any uh, uh, formalized role for IMF uh, to dictate any terms to Pakistan's, uh, uh, Pakistan's governing uh, political party because they play a role of a discipline maker. They can tell you, as was mentioned by Sharyar, very important point he raised was, we are at least, I am looking towards the political party's manifesto, what kind of a, uh, the reforms are concerned in Pakistan, the structural reforms in economy, in parliament, in judiciary, in bureaucracy. You don't do that. I don't believe you are going to get out of the woods anytime soon because if we go with the same team, for example, you look, look at Pakistan Muslim League and you look at Pakistan Tehrik and Saab, they've got a set of ministers and they keep on fielding them every now and then. They do not let the young generation come up and take uh, the, the helm of affairs as far as the political mm. parties are concerned. We don't see any pragmatic I mean, if, solutions to the existing problems. If we are going problems. to have the same team mm. for, from any political party, what do you expect? Mm. The same results. There are no out-of-box solutions because the problems are myriad, the challenges are so huge that if you don't have a think tank, in anywhere, Mariam, in any democracy, the, what political parties do, they assemble a team of experts, uh, energy, privatization, uh, economy, uh, investment, uh, foreign investment, trade, etc., etc. You assemble a team, you assign them a particular task, and uh, in the first 100 days, you set an agenda, a pace, you chart a course and direction, and you tell the people, look, these are our priorities, and after 100 days time period, we are going to implement in short term, in medium term, in long term. What we see, only rhetoric and no results. If the same is the situation in Pakistan, Mariam, it is a ticking bomb, we call it the youth bulge. Uh, more than 65% population is a young population. What kind of a solution any political party they have for as far as the youth is concerned? The major uh, demand of the youth is job creation. Do we have the private sector, the strength in the private sector to incorporate, to absorb such a huge number of uh, young students coming out of the universities? No. Then what happens really is the despondency, the desperation to leave the country. Of course. And resultantly what you have is the brain drain. And this is what is happening. About a million people left in, two, in 2022 uh, and uh, same as the number in 2023 right. as well. So I think as far as the political parties are concerned, they need to understand that their survival depends on the kind of solutions they are going to present uh, to the people of Pakistan, and that is in the form of manifestos, of course. Mm. We are not trying to reinvent the wheel in Pakistan. Everywhere in the world where there are democracies, political parties come out with a manifesto, a practical manifesto. Mm. A practical as, roadmap. Yes, that as, is as was pointed out, that then you go to the hustings, you tell the people, look, we have been able to do achieve this, but we have not been able to achieve these promises. We'll do them in the next term. Hmm. But I think, unfortunately, right. uh, the political parties, they haven't learned the lesson. Right. Ishijar, uh, this SPIED report is, of course, very revealing that mm -hmm. the major political parties, all three major political parties, PMLN, PPP, and PTI scored less than 20% on the critical issues or critical challenges that are faced by the nation. In your opinion, what are the key challenges uh, that should be addressed in the fresh manifestos of these parties? So, uh, Mariam, I have looked at uh, two manifestos that have like come mm -hmm. forward. Like one is from the PPP, one is from Jamaat Islami JI. Even that is not a manifesto, just ten point agenda. By exactly. The so it's a ten point agenda by PPP. Uh, JI has basically come up with a fifty-two page uh, agenda. Document, yes. But I see like a lot of like tall promises. Again, I don't like see them backed by any policy reforms. So when I was like looking at uh, uh, PPP's uh, uh, ten point agenda, it was like more like focusing on uh, uh, you know the farmers and like everything will give them subsidies. This like whole concept of subsidies is like the reason why we have like reached this point up till now. So these are like the promises or the pulls that you have 
for the common voter to vote for a political party. And most of the times, these promises are not backed by any policy-related uh, reforms or any policy and statements. And where the money is going to come by. Where will we get this money to like, give these subsidies? Mm. Secondly, this is very important if we link it to the IMF program that you were like mentioning and the negotiations that will be taking place as soon as the new government comes in. There is no political party that can offer subsidies as, as of right now. I can give you this promise right now. IMF will be very tough mm. and consistency of policy will be the number one challenge. Yes. That and the are these parties prepared to take those uh, politically difficult decisions? Any of these parties. Have they basically even done their homework in what kind of reforms the IMF is requiring from the government? And as you mentioned, tough decisions. And the tough decision will be politically unpopular decisions. Yes. Uh, there will be a lot of like, uh, in the short term, there will be a lot of challenges that people mm. will have to like go through. Of course. Uh, there will be increase in uh, commodity prices. Do we have an agenda on how to increase Pakistan's income? They're right. Like so, Sharia, yeah. uh, what needs to be done by these political parties so that their manifestos <coughs> go beyond this uh, rhetoric <coughs> and present some implementable solutions uh, to these challenges, especially let's talk about economic instability. So, Mariam, like first of all, this like whole idea of political manifestos that needs an overhaul. Mm. So, f this uh, manifestos do not need to be a document in which you distribute gifts to your voter. So we have to like come out of this like whole uh, culture of like throwing like sweets to uh, our voters that in return of your vote we will give you these gifts. So this is like how the political parties have been treating your general voter. Now there is like a lot of like awareness because of the media because of like social media as Hamayun Saab was mentioning. People require uh, not just promises but they also like require a direction in which the country has to like go through. And any party that cannot give a clear direction for the next five years will not be like getting a lot of like uh, uh, attraction from the voters, I would like say. So uh, in terms of, as Jadun Saab mentioned, the youth basically wants uh, ownership and they want job creations and they want to like see a positive future in which they want to like work towards achieving their goals. Uh, are we ready to increase our tax base? Are we, what are, uh, what are our uh, plans of increasing the productivity and exports of Pakistan? How will we basically uh, uncover the circular debt that is like eating our uh, resources? What about the privatization of the state-owned enterprises? In the last like 10 to 15 years, all of these political parties have made promises. Every political party comes into power. They don't like give you any way of like curtailing the uh, circular debt. They don't give you a way forward in terms of privatization that is like required. These mm. are the questions that IMF will be asking as of soon course. as you go into the negotiation uh, table with them. And these uh, uh, will not be fulfilled by empty promises that are always right. made uh, right. on manifestos. So, uh, Mr. Humayu, uh, of course, uh, what needs to be done in, ca uh, in, uh, in the light of this PIDE report, very revealing report, what strategies must be employed the by these political parties uh, that uh, Th the strategies that are somewhat implementable and that go beyond, of course, the empty promises and uh, that can actually address the economic uh, challenges, the debt challenges that the country is facing. <coughs> Mariam, I guess uh, now the time has come that the political parties have to up their ante in a way like they have to uh, walk the talk as well because they have always been talking and talking and not uh, focusing in terms of the issues which Yudun Sabha has raised, in terms of the issues which uh, Sharia just raised. We need structural reforms. We need proper long-term economic policies. We need these state enterprises to start functioning in, a, in, in, a, in an equitable way and in a profitable way at the same time. We need delivery of services. We need health reform. We need education reform. We need police reforms. And then on top of that, we also need a very comprehensive foreign policy as well. Uh, if you see our uh, recent history of last 10 to 15 years, uh, the respective governments have not been able to do that. And I can, I'm not here to represent any political parties, but the issues were huge. And the internal division within the political parties in terms of continuing with the good policies of the previous government, or in terms of the policies which they have to implement when they come in power, because now we, whoever or whichever government comes in uh, in play in next few months, 
they have to follow the IMF restrictions. And by the way, the, a lot of those restrictions are in a way good for us if we could implement them and then get rid of them in a longer term. But the, the moment any political party takes charge, there is always an internal division. There's an internal political unrest. The other political parties start pulling their legs. So this, uh, this uh, scenario, which has been there for the last 50, 60 years, is something which cannot sustain now because Pakistan has come on the verge of a crisis if we don't sit together, if we don't make long-term comprehensive structural reforms and policies, no one political party can do anything. And then you're very right, the SPIDE report is also very revealing. But then there are reasons for why they have failed. But again, if we continue looking back, uh, back on our failures, we will not be able to implement a comprehensive strategy for future. So my recommendation and my hope and my prayer to our uh, political leaders that now is the time that you have to have, and uh, Jadun Sa very clearly mentioned, you know, we have tried a lot of these uh, economists in the past. We need to have youngsters. We you need to have innovative brains. We need to have a policy where we would have an inclusive approach of the entire uh, brain, which could, uh, which could basically churn this mill in a way that become a sustainable policies for our our future. But if they don't do that now, I think time will uh, or the history will uh, not forget them. Right. Uh, so Jadun Sab, you earlier mentioned as well uh, about uh, the involvement of. of experts uh, in these political parties. So in your opinion, what needs to be done by these political parties at this point in time to engage uh, experts, economic experts, uh, energy experts, climate change experts uh, in brainstorming sessions uh, to, of course, make out some, uh, some inclusive roadmap uh, for the challenges that have been uh, f that are being faced by the country because these challenges are persistent and they are only growing right. Mariam, uh, as they say in extraordinary times you need to make extra extraordinary decisions as well in pakistan's context i think it is about time that we must make extraordinary decisions to uh, correct the uh, the course, the path mm, we, have already, discourse. we have already charted. We need to have a different path now. We need to chart a different course for Pakistan's economy and politics as well. In my opinion, what is eating up Pakistan's political fabric? One is the dynastic politics and other factor is the cult politics. This is not acceptable in modern democracies uh, for a long time because y if you have dynastic politics, what happens, a particular family uh, controls the entire political system and the political thought process as well. Mm -hmm. You only like people around you who can say yes to whatever you suggest. You don't like people who disagree with you. For example, uh, the technocrats. The technocrats will only tell you what is right uh, for the country, not right for the party or the party leadership. The other pitfall Pakistan is faced with is the cult politics. You don't question your leadership. Mm. You believe and you have a blind trust and faith. And whatever is uttered by the leadership, you believe that it is the right thing. And you really can't, mm. even those who disagree, uh, they are targeted ruthlessly. And uh, they, uh, they believe beleaguered as well. Now in Pakistan's context, I think it is about time that political parties first need to introduce democracies within. Then they should be talking about democracy in Pakistan. If you do not have democracy within the political parties, what you really want is to come into power at whatever cost you have to pay for that. Mm. You make very unnatural alliances uh, when uh, you disagree with the political party on manifestos, political ideology, political f philosophy. One party is on the right side and the other is on the left side of the divide and one is on the middle of the divide. How it is possible that uh, the other day uh, because of the uh, because of the issue of marriage of convenience, mm. you start making alliances which are very mm. unnatural. Of course, your political philosophies, your agendas, economic, in other ways, they clash with each of other. Course. You come into power. For example, I can give you the example of 16 months of coalition government. Mm. Nobody owns yeah. the decisions or the so, blunders or the so mistake Jadun committed sir, by what, what these 16 to, months. What needs to be done to shift this political discourse from a game of musical chairs? Uh, to uh, something that addresses the challenges of people. Uh, of course, the challenges like economic instability and the talks that are going to be held uh, with IMF because the world is looking towards those uh, IMF talks as well because all our foreign direct investment is also tied with the, those talks. 
I think IMF is uh, one challenge which we, I think we mm -hmm. have got no option other than we have to uh, renegotiate and uh, th there would be certain conditionalities on part of the IMF as we have seen in the past as well. Mm -hmm. What they really want is to introduce some kind of a discipline in Pakistan's economy. For example, as mentioned by Sharia, you can't dole out uh, your subsidies because you want to please a certain segment of mm -hmm. the society. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, you keep doling out money and the people get used to it and they don't find other, uh, other options uh, to create income for themselves and for their families as well. Do not do that. Why can't you create opportunities as far as the business is concerned? Why can't you create opportunities as far as new jobs are concerned? Because absorbing such a huge number of young people into the economy is such a challenge that if you don't realize it today, as I pointed out many times in many shows, I said, uh, Mariam, less than uh, the youth bulge contains the age less than 30 years. What are the aspirations? Mm. Uh, and it's a double-edged sword. You can use it positively. More than 200 mm. uh, new voters enlisted themselves between 2018 and 2023. Yes. What are their expectations mm. from the politicians and the political parties? Mm. With such a with such a uh, breathtaking speed, we see new voters registering in Pakistan's political system. Mm. But we do not have answers to the modern times. Our political parties are still embedded in 80s and 90s. Look at the top tier leadership. They are clumsy, they are inertia uh, driven, mm. they are uh, uh, literally without any fresh ideas as far as Pakistan's uh, challenges are concerned. I can give you an example. Why SIFC <laughs> comes into being and they can address the challenge of hoarding and uh, smuggling. Mm. Why the successive governments never thought about that? You can always say, maybe the apologists would say, well, it, because of the establishment's intervention, we were not able to do that. Has establishment ever stopped any political party to introduce uh, health reforms, mm. education reforms? Have they ever stopped any political party to create jobs for the young people? I don't see that. Maybe they can say that the foreign policy is a hostage to the establishment, even in foreign policy. What kind of out-of-box solutions you can give? Pakistan sits in a region which is strategically so important. It provides you connectivity with South Asia, with Central Asia, with Middle East, and even beyond to Europe as well. How we have benefited from that? Uh, the Americans fought 20 years bat uh, war in Afghanistan. They wanted to cut loose and run from, uh, from Pakistan. What did we get in quid pro, uh, quid pro quo as far as the Americans when they wanted Pakistan to facilitate uh, the peace process in, in Afghanistan? They wanted to leave the region. They have left the region. And now if we keep looking towards the Americans for any assistance as far as economic assistance is concerned, I think America is more fixa fixated now in the Indo-Pacific region. They want India to play a role which they wanted Pakistan to play a role when right. the Soviets came into Afghanistan. So my point is, these are the changing times. Mm. Th these are the challenges of the 21st century. But I, personally speaking, I don't feel that any political party which is at the helm right now, those who are staking claims to come into power, they do not have the answers to these very complex, very intricate myriad of challenges which Pakistan is right. facing so today. Shijar, what can political parties do uh, to address uh, these uh, challenges? And of course, the technical shortcomings, should. Uh, how can they be uh, included in these manifestos? Uh, specifically, like you earlier mentioned about the quantitative targets uh, that, of course, uh, uh, the public can later uh, hold them accountable for. What needs to be done? to make uh, things like that? So, Mariam, like uh, this time around, it's time for innovation and it's time for out-of-the-box solutions. Business as usual cannot work and same faces cannot deliver. So, because this program is like focused on manifestos, personally speaking, I think like it's the time for manifestos is gone. You know, it's like less than one month mm -hmm. uh, into elections. But there now, are many technical shortcomings that we have witnessed in the definitely. previous because manifestos. Shalyan, people uh -huh. must have a time to read, go through the manifestos and decide which party's manifesto suits Pakistan and suits that particular segment. Because they don't I have agree. time to, uh, for that anymore. So like way forward, I would personally see that this time around the concept of Western democracies, they work on this concept of shadow cabinets. Mm -hmm. What do shadow cabinets do? Shadow cabinets are made up of intellectuals, academics, experts in their relative fields, and they basically come up with like policy solutions, mm -hmm. long-term policy reforms, and they present that to the minister or the person it's who's a the face process of the uh, yes. process. This shadow cabinet is shielded from politics, and their job is to make policy. Mm. 
the person who's in charge, the minister, his job is to implement that policy. And this policy should be a long-term reform in coordination with the team that will be coordinating with the IMF. And all of these like key ministries have to be linked. They should not be working in silos. Right now, even within a government, every minister is in competition with each <coughs> other and they don't like cooperate. Mm -hmm. The Ministry of uh, Energy Production, everything, they do not like coordinate with the Ministry of Finance. Mm -hmm. They make their own promises, their own agendas, and that is like separate from the overall holistic policy of the government. So all of these like key ministries, first of all, they need to start communicating with each other. Mm -hmm. They need to incorporate experts and technocrats from the field who will be feeding the policy reforms and like the policy uh, solutions to the re elected representative. Right. And all of this needs to happen in coordination, very close coordination, and that is the only way forward. Right, but Sharia, you mentioned that there is very less time for the manifestos, but even uh, in the online discourse, we see that there are no uh, practical solutions mm -hmm. so far presented uh, by the parties or the party leadership when we look at the challenges, economic instability, mm -hmm. uh, climate crisis, these mm -hmm. are the issues that are not addressed uh, in even the online discourse. Uh, Mariam, unfortunately, we are a country that basically always has focused on firefighting mm -hmm. and we haven't like focused on long-term reforms. So we've always had policies that are reactive and they're not like policies that are long-term in future. So whenever a crisis presents to us, we try to like fight it from the tools that are available to us for short-term gains. And unfortunately, a lot of like political parties do not really have a long-term agenda. So first of all, the whole like thinking and the way political parties operate, that needs to overhaul. Secondly, the positions or key ministries or the key decision-making posts in any government should be given to people who have the expertise in that field rather than like having links with the party leadership. Not on the basis of favoritism, mm. but on the basis of expertise. And that expertise has to be compounded by a team of experts or specialists in that area. That is the only way uh, effective evidence-based policy making can be developed in Pakistan. Evidence-based pol uh, policy making takes into account political considerations, but it also like works and like takes decisions which are politically unpopular. And all of these political parties will have to like change the way they basically operate and develop policies that are good for Pakistan. And in the short term, it might pinch the masses. It might decrease their popularity, mm. but in the long term, this mm. will take Pakistan in the right direction that is needed. Mm. Of course, politically difficult decisions uh, need to be taken. Um, uh, moving forward, uh, Mr. Humayo, uh, uh, lastly, can you tell us that uh, what are some of the global best practices for policy making that should be on incorporated in manifestos or uh, in, the uh, in the online discourse that is being presented uh, by the leadership of these political parties? Uh, Mariam, there are many uh, best practices and then there are many uh, different uh, economic model of governance model which are successfully being operated and run in the world. But if you see within the region, we have two examples next door. One is uh, India and the other one is Bangladesh. Uh, Bangladesh, surprisingly, uh, we, I was just listening to Jadun Saab and he mentioned very rightly, we have a very uh, dynastic sort of a political setup within Pakistan, but same goes for Bangladesh. Which got, uh, uh, which became a country in 1971, and then up till now, their respective uh, political parties and their two main political parties, Awami League and uh, the BNP, there. And this time, Awami League again. It happened yesterday election, and they won the fourth time. Uh, look at the economic indicators of Bangladesh. They have been, they were more in 1971 in terms of a number. Uh, now they've reduced their, or they've controlled their population to 160, 270 million. Their GDP has, uh, growth rate has increased. Their climate change strategies are basically considered one of the best in the world now, though they are like suffering uh, the most. Then comes uh, on the other side, India. We have many uh, examples there. The current uh, uh, government, which has taken a very uh, bad fund policy decision vis-a-vis -vis when it comes to Pakistan, but uh, for a little bit, Time. Let's discuss on the, the economic model. They've been able to revive their economic model in, in a very consistent way. So I think the, the one thing which needs to be taken into account is the consistency of the policies. 
uh, we can come up with like uh, 1000 different suggestions, uh, a technocratic model and economic model where expertise are there. But that's exactly a parliamentary democracy is supposed to be. You elect th those people and then they are head of the ministry and the ministry has technical staff. The bureaucrats are supposed to be technically expert people. So and the minister is a political person who takes this decision. So in, in, in a democracy, it's very difficult. And then the demographic of Pakistan is also unfortunately not in, in a very favorable condition. Most of the political parties are either from one ethnic region or another region. And then we have, after the 18th Amendment, provinces are more powerful in terms of revenue generation, in terms of expenditure, in terms of the policies. Like a lot of reforms that we're talking about, health reform, police reforms, uh, economic reforms can be done a lot by the, the provinces themselves. And apart from that, we also need to have a very good local government system, which has been mm. the basis of democracy and has been missing for a very long time in our uh, the governance discourse in the country. So if we make those right. uh, for, uh, these smaller cities or these union councils more economically, profitably run enterprises on themselves, the uh, parliament has to do the legislation, which basically set the course of the future uh, economic policies, which again has been lacking. Of course. Thank you very much, Mr. Humayun Khan, for joining us in today's program. Thank you very much, Mr. Javed Khan Jadoon, for joining us in today's program. Thank you very much, Mr. Shiryar Khan, for joining us in today's program. Of course, the next few days provide a window of opportunity for these political parties to demonstrate their seriousness uh, to address uh, the economic instability and other challenges faced by the country. That's all from Game Changer tonight. Take care. Allah Hafiz.